DC. Uh, I am honored to welcome you all to the today's uh, webinar. First and foremost, I would like to welcome today's uh, speaker, George Frizzle, uh, who is joining us uh, from U uh, USA. Uh, actually, he has a wealth, ex wealth experience uh, related to the rocketry uh, science as a researcher and also as a teacher. And he has uh, more than 30 years of experience and he is also a certified property teacher by National Association of Property, NRA, United States of America. So thank you very much for joining with us today, Mr. Pistol. And also I would like to welcome members of the uh, students of SED's uh, SLTC and University of Moratua. And also I was told that uh, some of the uh, students from other universities also joining with us today. So uh, I would like to extend my welcome to all of you. And also I am pretty sure that uh, today's uh, workshop uh, and also webinar will be a good opportunity for Sri Lankan students to learn a lot of new stuff from Mr. Prisal. Uh, and I am pretty sure it will be a very productive one. Once again, I will welcome you all to the today's event and I'm pretty sure it will be a very productive uh, workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nand. And I can go on and on about Mr. Frizzle's achievements, his talents, but I'm pretty sure you're not logged in here to listen to me, right? So without any further ado, I'd like to invite our special guest lecturer, Mr. Josh Frizzle, the stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. It's an honor to be here. Uh, this is really fun for us to get to interact with uh, folks around the world and have a captive audience and something that we are interested in. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen. I have some slides that I'm gonna go through. Okay, here we go. So um, to get going here on our presentation, we're doing introduction to model rocketry. This presentation is geared for uh, the newcomers, uh, but we will also touch on some uh, slightly more advanced topics as we go along. But uh, if you're if you're totally new to rocketry, this is going to be a good a good course for you. Um, a little bit about me. I mean, I've already had a really nice introduction, so thank you for that. But uh, I started this, I started rocketry when I was in my early teens and I'm now in my uh, mid forties. So that gives you an idea about how long I've been doing it. Um, level two high power certified, uh, certified by the National Association Rocketry uh, program called NAR-T CERT, which is a, a rocketry teaching uh, program. Also have uh, authored some rocketry how-to articles for the Apogee Components Peak of Flight newsletter, which is free. You can check that out at uh, apogeerockets.com. They have a really nice repository mm -hmm. of rocketry how-to knowledge spanning from very basic to rather advanced, uh, all free. So check that out. Um, first, I have to uh, get into uh, safety, which is uh, number one. I'd like to start off by saying this is an activity that can be done safely. I've probably seen thousands of rocket launches between my own and seeing other people launch their rockets at club launch gatherings. And I've never seen anyone get hurt doing rocketry, but that's because we dedicate ourselves to safety. So uh, from a safety standpoint, we have some challenges. Uh, with amateur equipment, we can easily exceed 500 kilometers per hour. Uh, you start getting into the high power realm, it's really not that hard to reach supersonic speed. So obviously, we need to be careful, respect what we're dealing with. We don't want one of these things hitting anyone or some property. We're also dealing with very flammable uh, propellants. We're dealing with uh, some explosive materials, uh, little explosive charges, for example, that we use to deploy parachutes and perform different flight functions. So we have to have a respect for what we're doing. I don't say this to scare anyone off, because again, to reiterate, this is definitely something that can be done safely if you dedicate yourself to safety but we do have to have a healthy respect for what we're dealing with. So again, we need to have a safety mindset. 
Uh, safety is premeditated and intentional, so we're actively looking for hazards and how we can control the hazards. Uh, when in doubt, don't launch and avoid go fever. What we mean by that is maybe you've spent a lot of time working on a rocket and you've got all your equipment out at the launch site. Maybe you've got friends and family there watching and you're really excited to do it, but maybe you see a little crack in one of the fins or maybe the the wind conditions are not quite right. That's when you have to step back and say, no, we're not gonna launch, make the safety call. Experienced people in the rocketry community will respect those that make a no-go decision based on safety. And it's okay to do a no-go, right? And that's what you should do. Um, I would take a look at the National Association of Rocketry's safety code. They, and that's a United States organization but the spirit of what's in the safety code is really applicable to anyone, anywhere. A lot of good stuff about um, the appropriate field size, how far away you should be from the rocket when you ignite the motor, making sure you have an adequate thrust, designing for stability. All these things are in the code and I'm gonna talk more about them in more detail throughout this presentation, but definitely give that a look. I also recommend you wear safety glasses. Eyes are very fragile, probably one of the more important part of your body, but uh, take good care of them, protect them, wear some safety glasses. That's a cheap investment in protecting yourself. So uh, with that said, let's uh, get into the meat of the presentation, what everybody's here for. I'd like to start with a little teaser video. We're gonna advance this just a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. But um, this is a, a video camera uh, mounted to the side of the rocket looking downward. Um, what we see are two of the fins and so we see a wire coming in and that is um, Sorry, just admitting a few people in from the waiting room, but um, the, the electrical wire coming in from the side. That is how we ignite it safely from a distance. You're going to see the motor ignite the rocket is going to generate thrust, accelerate, accelerate away from the ground. You'll see the motor burn out as it runs out of momentum. It'll reach, this rocket will reach around 700 meters of altitude and you'll see it uh, run out of momentum, nose over, and you'll see a couple little puffs of smoke. Those are little explosive charges that will deploy a parachute. So forewarned, this is a rather loud video. So if you're wearing headphones, you've got the volume turned up, that would, now would be a good time to turn it down. But uh, here we go. Let's watch. Where is the play? There we go. How do you do that? All right, so that was our little video. Let's uh, let's get into the meat of it. Uh, let's admit one more here. Okay, still have a few folks showing up, and I'm admitting people as we go along. But um, let's go to the next slide. No, that's not what we want. Okay, so let's get into design. So when we design a rocket, our ultimate goal is we want to design it for flight stability. And what I mean by stability is. The rocket will inherently maintain a, a straight flight path. We don't have any outside control. We're not controlling it via radio from the ground. It doesn't have any computers. Just the shape of the rocket will inherently cause it to maintain a more or less straight flight path. Uh, the rocket will spontaneously correct itself if it's perturbed. So if it hits some air turbulence, for example, it can on its own correct itself and point its nose back in the direction that it was traveling. And it does this by exploiting the airflow over the rocket to maintain a straight flight. And that's just, again, it's just based on the design of the shape of the rocket. So let's talk about that in more detail. So if we want to break down rocket design and stability into its simplest form, we can really kind of look at two key um, parameters. One is the center of gravity. That is a location on the rocket where uh, it's marked by this blue circle here. That is the, the, the center of, basically the center of mass. So on either side of that point, there's equal mass. So if you suspended the rocket from just that one point, it would balance at that point. 
And the key thing to understand about the center of gravity is that a flying object will always rotate around the center of gravity. In other words, it's, it's physically impossible while this rocket is flying to get it to rotate around the nose, for example. Whenever we apply an unbalanced force, it will always rotate around the center of gravity. Okay, the other key location that we're interested in is the center of pressure, and that is where the aerodynamic force is balanced. So as the rocket is pushing its way through air, the air is flowing around the rocket, and that center of pressure is where the aerodynamic force is balanced. So for us to have a stable rocket, the key thing to understand here is the center of pressure must be behind the center of gravity. So effectively, the fins behind the center of gravity, if, if the rocket, for example, turns sideways, is not quite flying straight through the air, the air will hit the fins, cause it to rotate around the center of gravity, and point the nose back in the direction that it was traveling. That's what we want. So how do we know if we have enough stability built into the rocket? Well, we can look at what's called the stability margin. So we take the distance between the center of gravity and the center of pressure, and we divide it by the diameter or what we call the caliber of the rocket. And that's a way to normalize the distance between the center of gravity and the center of pressure to the overall size of the rocket. And we generally want to design for a stability margin that's between one and three calibers. And that's a rough rule of thumb. It's not absolute. But where does the one come from? I mean, theoretically, if we had any positive number for that stability margin, theoretically, the rocket should be stable. But that gives us no margin for error. It gives no margins for error in our calculations. It doesn't allow for less than ideal conditions that we're flying in. So we say one caliber of stability as a rule of thumb. And we also say three as an upper bound. And we'll talk about why that is further in the presentation. But the, the key takeaway here is center of gravity, all things rotate around the center of gravity when they're flying. Center of pressure must be behind the center of gravity for the rocket to be stable. And the farther apart the center of gravity and the center of pressure are, the more stable the rocket will be. So effectively now we can just imagine it as a simple lever problem, right? So if we imagine the center of gravity as the fulcrum in a lever and the center of pressure is the force that we're applying to the lever, the farther out from that pivot point that we put the center of pressure, the more effective it will be and it will be able to make corrections as it flies. All right, so as we're designing a rocket, we can manipulate where the center of gravity and where the center of pressure are so we can design a stable rocket. So factors affecting where the center of gravity are. One is the aspect ratio. So is it very long and slender or is it a short and stubby rocket? How long is it compared to how narrow it is? Long and slender rockets will tend to be more stable because that shape tends to shift the center of gravity forward. We also look at the mass of the motor. So the motor is where the propellant is. That's the, probably in most rockets, the heaviest part. And it's in the back of the rocket, which is the worst place from a stability standpoint because we're putting a lot of weight in the back of the rocket, we're shifting the center of gravity backwards. We don't want that. So we have to account for that in our design. We may have to make other concessions in our design. If we have, say for example, a short stubby rocket with a really big motor in it, we may have to make some other design changes to compensate for that. One way we can do that is add nose weight. Okay, so if we have a lot of weight in the back that we need to compensate for, we can also add weight to the nose, for example, to shift the gravity, center of gravity forward, that will make the rocket overall more stable. Also, if we have a payload, uh, generally we'll put that up at the front of the rocket. Again, that'll shift the center of gravity forward. Okay, so we can manipulate the center of gravity as we do our design. Uh, we can also manipulate the center of pressure. So factors affecting the center of pressure, one is the fin shape. So if we look at the two rockets pictured on the right here, so the, the, the rocket on the left has fins that are swept to the rear. So that puts more surface area farther back on the rocket, which shifts the center of pressure rearward. So that puts the center of pressure farther back. That's a good thing from a st stability standpoint. So the shape of the fins plays a role. In contrast, the, the rocket next to it, the fins are not shaped that way. It does not have that swept back fins. So the fins are still there, they're still effective, but that shape is probably not providing as much stability as the other fin shape, right? Uh, the fin size and the number of fins, those play a role in the surface area of the fins. So larger fins or more fins shift the center of pressure towards the rear. 
that's going to make the rocket more stable. Overall rocket shape sometimes will have a big, uh, you know, say a large payload fairing at the top that's going to have a destabilizing effect because it's shifting the center of pressure forward. Right? So some design tools that can help you figure all this out. Uh, one is a free software called Open Rocket. It's open source. You can download it for free, use it for free. That will calculate all these parameters, the center of pressure, the center of gravity, the stability margin. It'll calculate all of them for you. Uh, once you enter in some information about your diameters, what materials you're using. So the software knows the density of the materials that you're using, but it'll calculate all those parameters for you. Um, another propriety, proprietary software that's out there uh, is called Roxim. It's available from Apogee Components. Uh, might be a good option if you want something that has like actual you know, people maintaining it and technical support. Uh, just keeping in mind they're in the USA, so they're gonna be open in the middle of the night in Sri Lanka, but that's another option. All right, so let's look at this example. This is the SpaceX Falcon 9, and it appears to go against everything we just said about rocket stability, but apparently they know what they're doing. I mean, they've been putting satellites into orbit, sending people to the International Space Station. So how are they pulling this off? This rocket appears to be designed all wrong. Uh, it's got no fins. These black structures are actually landing legs. They don't provide any flight stability. They got this big bulb up at the top for the payload, which is shifting their center of pressure forward. So how are they achieving this? Well, they have thrust vector control. So there's computers and gyros and keeping track of the orientation of the rocket and whether or not it's on course and it's actively directing the thrust. So those engines, despite being as huge as they are, they can move back and forth with a great deal of precision and keep the rocket on course. So thrust vector control, again, it's computer controlled. Uh, it's mostly common in high performance orbital class rockets going all the way back, you know, to the Saturn V that went to the moon and even before that, you know, to the V2 rockets used by the Germans in World War II had some uh, degree of thrust vector control. Um, it's relatively rare in hobby and sport rocketry, but that's becoming a lot more common. That's changing as, you know, microcontrollers, for example, become readily available to the hobbyist. Uh, thrust vector control is also becoming more common. All right. So we talked about uh, designing our rocket so that the stability margin is generally roughly between one and three. So we said a maximum of three. Why is there a maximum, right? Stability is a good thing. However, we can have a rocket that is what we call overstable. So there's always, you know, generally wind blowing it, you know, just naturally, right? So that's hitting the rocket horizontally and that can cause a weather vane effect. So that wind blowing horizontally is going to push on that greater surface area on the fins at the rear of the rocket and actually cause it to turn into the wind. So how do we deal with that? Well, again, we're gonna design our rocket shooting for a stability margin between one and three. You know, it's, that's not to say that a rocket outside that range can't fly well, that's, it can, but that's a good uh, starting point to design too, is try to shoot for your uh, stability margin to be between one and three. Also, we need to make sure we apply uh, plenty of thrust to accelerate it to uh, plenty of speed so that the airflow over the fins is adequate. The fins can be effective. And a good rule of thumb is we want the rocket to leave at the, the launch pad. You know, it'll have a guide rail, which we'll talk about later in this presentation. But we want the rocket to leave the launch rail at at least four times of velocity uh, of what the maximum wind gust is. And that's gonna give you some mar safety margin so that you'll know the fins are gonna be plenty effective to overcome the effects of the wind, right? And uh, again, Open Rocket can calculate that for you. You can select the length of the launch rod, for example. You can, you know, you'll have the, the mass of the rocket accounted for, the thrust of the motor will be in there. So it will calculate a speed at which the rocket leaves the launch rod and you can predetermine that you're going to have a safe flight based on that. All right, so now we've designed our rocket, what are we going to build it out of? So let's start with the body tube, which is that cylinder that makes up the main body of the rocket. Uh, starting out for beginners, best thing is just cardboard or 
Some folks will roll a, a paper tube out of like a heavy duty cardstock. That's a great way to start. It's lightweight, inexpensive. However, it's relatively fragile, but that can be a good thing. When we're starting out, we're learning, right? Let's say our worst case scenario, we've done our due diligence safety wise, but still the worst happens and a rocket hits a person or property, right? Something like cardboard or a cardstock rocket can crumble and accept that energy of impact rather than say somebody's skull accepting that impact, right? So cardboard's a great way to start. Um, in the big red circle off to the right, I have no PVC, uh, PVC or polyvinyl chloride plastic, which is the plastic tubes or pipes that are often used in plumbing. It shatters into little tiny sharp shards if something explodes, for example. So um, we don't use PVC in rockets. It's actually explicitly banned at most clubs here in the United States. So cardboard, cardstock is a great way to start. Uh, more advanced uh, is the fiberglass and the carbon fiber. You'll see that with, you know, more advanced flyers building high power, high performance rockets. So the fiberglass is really durable, although it's relatively heavy, rather expensive, but it's great stuff to build high power rockets out of. You'll see the carbon fiber uh, more in really high performance rockets. It's very expensive, but it's great for rockets that are operating well into the supersonic regime. Uh, again, more of a more advanced material, very expensive, but it's out there. So let's talk about the nose cone. Um, if you buy a, a, a rocket in a kit, the nose coat will more than likely be either plastic or balsa wood, both are good. Uh, plastic, good for low all the way on up to high power. It's lightweight, it's inexpensive. Balsa is also very lightweight. Balsa wood can be easily shaped with sandpaper. So if you wanna make your own nose cone out of say a block of balsa wood, you certainly can just by using you know, a whittling knife and some sandpaper, you can shape it into a cone. Inexpensive way to go. Low durability though, balsa wood is very soft. You can even scratch it with your fingernail, but it's, it's great for low power, uh, you know, small rockets, good stuff. And of course, again, we have the fiberglass, carbon fiber nose cones out there for uh, more advanced rockets. Uh, for the fins, uh, plywood is really good all the way from low to high power. Even my, a lot of my largest high power rockets have plywood fins on the order of five to six millimeters thick, holds up very well. Um, sometimes I'll also reinforce that with a layer of fiberglass and laminating resin, uh, but plywood's a, a really good, inexpensive, easy to get your hands on option. Also can use the balsa, sheets of balsa wood for fins, very lightweight, although rather fragile. And of course, the fiberglass and carbon fiber for the more advanced rockets. All right, so we've got our materials laid out. We've got our design now. We have to put this thing together. What are we going to use for adhesives? So for the low power rockets, we talked about you know using cardboard, balsa wood, plywood, wood glue or paper uh, glue is going to work just fine. Uh, working uh, with the larger, higher power rockets, we're looking at uh, high strength two part epoxy. Okay, so with the bigger rockets, greater forces involved. We don't want to mess around. We're using uh, more uh, robust adhesives. All right, so we've got our rocket, we've got our materials, we've built it with our adhesives, time to make it go. So let's talk a little bit about propulsion. So um, in a very general sense, usually a rocket fuel is going to be a fuel and an oxidizer. So generally speaking, anything that burns in air is going to burn better and more aggressively in the presence of a stronger oxidizer. So a little fun side note, you may encounter folks that uh, even in 2020, or, you know, they believe in this flat earth, you know, that the round earth is a conspiracy or that the moon landings are a conspiracy. And one of their arguments may be that, well, the claim is that rockets can fly in space, but we know that can't be true because they operate on a principle of combustion and there's no air in space. Therefore, a rocket wouldn't work in space. Well, the irony is a rocket wouldn't work with the air in the atmosphere. You know, the 21% oxygen that we have in the air is insufficient to maintain a vigorous combustion reaction that a rocket needs to operate. So based on that, okay, flat earth uh, conspiracy, moon landing conspiracy debunked here officially. 
uh, at least based on the oxygen argument. Okay, so moving on, we have our fuel, we have our oxidizer, they burn, they create an expanding gas that creates pressure inside a combustion chamber. The only way for that pressure to exit the combustion chamber is through a hole called the nozzle. So the expanding gas rushing outward through the nozzle. We have expanding gas going one way, a rocket goes the other way. It's just a simple action and opposite reaction principle, okay? So let's talk about some different um, propellant types. Um, several, several types of propellants out there. Uh, first, the general class is the solid propellant where the fuel and the oxidizer are both solids. Uh, they're simple to prepare and ignite. This is where most people are going to start is with the solid propellants. However, even up into the most advanced levels of rocketry, that's going to be the mainstay. You go out to a, a high power club rocket launch, predominantly almost everybody's still going to be using solid propellants. They're still very capable propellants, even up to and including, you know, sounding rockets going into space and orbital class boosters. Uh, Solid propellants are still uh, still a mainstay. Um, we also have the hybrid propellant where we have a solid fuel mixed with a gas phase oxidizer. So for example, we might have uh, a cylinder of, of plastic and nitrous oxide as the oxidizer. Uh, much less common, but it's out there. It's more complex. There's some additional dangers involved, um, but it's out there. Uh, liquid propellants where we have fuel and liquid Oxidizers are, are they're both liquid. Uh, generally, that requires a lot of complex plumbing pumps. You're more going to see that in professional settings, you know, government space entities, for example. You don't really see that at uh, the amateur level, just due to the complexity of it. And let's not forget water rockets. So, uh, one way to make a rocket fly is uh, you have water in a pressurized vessel and you release the water, it rushes out the nozzle just like a rocket exhaust would. So you can still um, achieve, you know, some, some altitudes sufficient to make it fun, even with the pressurized water. All right, so let's delve a little more into the solid propellants um, and how we get them, how we get our hands on them so we can use them. So first, let's talk about those that are commercially available. Um, one is the black powder motor. So black powder, the fuel is carbon and sulfur with an oxidizer of potassium nitrate. Um, great place to start for beginners. Uh, they're easy to ignite. Um, I did sit in on the uh, presentation two days ago, the first uh, uh, episode of this workshop, and there appeared to be some interest in staging. Um, with the black powder motor, staging is actually very simple. Um, however, the black powder motors don't scale up well, so they'll usually see these in the, the low to mid power rockets. Um, when you try to make them bigger, that's susceptible to the propellants cracking and that can cause all kinds of uh, dangerous problems. So you'll generally see them in the, in the smaller rockets, but they're still a heck of a lot of fun. Um, on the, the photo on the right here, I just happened across this, this company uh, a couple weeks ago on Facebook, uh, Aerosports Association. And this uh, appears to be an example of a, a black rocket, a black powder rocket motor produced in India. Looks very similar to what we have in the United States. So might be worth checking them out. Um, another type of propellant available commercially is the ammonium perchlorate composite propellant. So it's basically the fuel is like a rubber. It actually feels like a rubber eraser, uh, maybe some aluminum in there. And the oxidizer is the ammonium perchlorate. So the advantage here is much greater thrust output for the weight of the motor. That's what we call specific impulse, basically how much bang we get for the weight of the motor. Uh, much better in the ammonium perchlorate composite motor than in the black powder motor. However, they are a little more difficult to ignite. Um, and that makes some challenges for, for staging. So the photo on the right, the orange motor, that's a kind of the one of the counterparts here in the United States, that's actually a, a small composite motor. So generally when you're buying commercially available motors, they're either gonna be black powder or this ammonium perchlorate composite. Um, let's also talk about experimental or homemade propellants. This is more of an advanced subject. You really wanna start off if you're a beginner with the commercially available motors, if you can get your hands on them. 
But uh, this is an aspect of the hobby that has a great deal of width and breadth. And it's, it's a really fun topic, in, in my opinion. Um, lots of different chemistries we can explore. Uh, first of all, what we call rocket candy, the fuel is uh, sugar or a sorbitol. Sorbitol is, is a sweetener, you'll see it in like toothpaste. Um, and the oxidizer is potassium nitrate. So readily, readily available materials typically, uh, fairly easy to, easy to get your hands on. Um, disadvantage of the rocket candy is it's very subject to humidity. So if you're in a very humid climate, it's going to be challenging to, you know, keep these um, propellant grains that you create, you know, not impacted or degraded by the humidity. The sorbitol tends to be a little better than just using plain sugar, but still need to be cognizant of the fact that humidity will degrade this type of propellant. Um, one thing we'll talk about later in the presentation is that an underpowered rocket can be just as dangerous as an overpowered rocket. And if your fuel is degraded, that's an underpowered problem. So again, something to be aware of. It's manageable, but you need to be aware of that. Um, also folks uh, on an experimental homemade lever level uh, make their own ammonium perchlorate composite motors. Lots of opportunities for experimentation and research there with different formulations, burn rate catalysts. You can make the flame appear a different color. Lots of fun things you can do. Uh, the photo of the cylinders on the right there, uh, those were created by uh, a couple guys that I fly with uh, at a rocket club that I fly with. Uh, those are homemade propellant grains. Uh, you'll notice there's a, a hole through the center. So when you use the ammonium perchlorate uh, propellant grains, they actually burn from the center out they burn along the whole length of the motor. So if you want to create additional thrust, you can just stack more grains on top of each other because it's going to burn from the center out along the whole length of that motor. So you have more propellant burning at the same time. Also some variability for possible experimentation, that hole doesn't have to be in the center. It can be offset, it can be different shape, that gives different thrust profiles among other other variables such as your nozzle geometry. So there's lots of opportunity for experimentation and playing around with these things when you get into uh, experimental propellants. Again, more of a, an advanced topic. If there is some more risk involved, if there are imperfections in the grain, it can result in an explosion. Uh, you're dealing with flammable stuff. So you know I know there's a lot of university folks on this call. Um, it's not something you want to be doing in the kitchen in the dorm room or something. You know it's out, an outside activity, uh, there is some risk involved, um, but really fun um, opportunity, in my opinion, uh, really interesting aspect to the hobby. Uh, if you're interested in looking into that, I have a few resources here. Um, this uh, Mr. Naka site, he uh, has a really good comprehensive website on a lot of different types of propellants. Um, the James Yon website is more dedicated to the rocket candy or the sugar fuels. Um, also a book, uh, Experimental Composite Propellants by Terry McCreary, PhD, uh, gets into the uh, composite propellant in detail. So uh, just to reiterate, uh, if you're starting out, you wanna try to get your hands on the commercial, commercially available motors first. That's a safer way to go. You've got motors that have been tested and vetted, um, but uh, the experimental propellants are a great way to expand the hobby. I will say generally, you know, most people that get really into the experimental propellants will tell you that you're not going to save a lot of money doing it that way. By the time you buy your materials, your equipment, you run some test motors, you know, unless you're really creating a lot of them, you're, it's not really going to save you money, but it's a really interesting aspect of the hobby. So it's something that you do for the love of it. Um, I know this uh, table was presented in quite a bit of detail in the call a couple of days ago, but I'll briefly touch on it. Um, this is a, a table of how we classify rocket motors seems to be pretty universally adhered to internationally, but it's based on the total power output of a rocket motor. So the rocket motors are classified by letter. You see that on the column on the left. Um, we take the average thrust of the motor in Newtons and we multiply that times how long that motor can maintain that thrust in seconds. So for example, if we have a motor that can produce, 
an average of 20 newtons of thrust for two seconds, right? We say 20 newtons times two seconds, right? That gives us 40 newton seconds. That will be an E-class motor. Um, if we look at the, the picture over here on the right of uh, an example motor, we see this is an E-class motor. So it's somewhere between 20 and 40 newton seconds of total impulse. The six after the E indicates that it has an average thrust of six newtons. So from that, we can deduce this motor probably has a burn time of between five and nine seconds probably, which is really a long time for a model rocket motor. This would be a really fun motor in a lightweight rocket. You'd get some serious altitude out of it, out of the E6. We'll talk about more about what the dash three after the E6 uh, means later on in the presentation. That's another important parameter of the motor. All right, so as we talk more about building our rocket, we talked about the airframe, you know, the body tube, the nose cone, the fins, we've talked about the motor. Also very important is the motor mount. We have to secure the motor into the rocket to make sure that it's not gonna shoot through the rocket and we end up with this wildly flailing fire stick that's out of control. We need to make sure the, the motor is secured into the rocket, both in a forward direction and a backward direction. Okay, so there's an example of a motor mount. Um, we have a, a motor tube in the center, so the motor will slide into that. We've got what are called centering rings, which are these discs around the motor tube, and that will be glued into the body tube. So we end up with kind of these concentric tubes with the body tube on the outside, the motor mount on the inside, which holds the motor, keeps it aligned with the rocket's longitudinal axis, and also secures it in place so it can't fly out of the rocket and Leave the rocket sitting on the launch pad with the motor off flying away on its own. So the picture on the left here, that's an example of the motor mount glued in place. Okay, so we talked about securing the motor in a forward direction so the motor can't shoot through the rocket. That's fairly intuitive, but less intuitive is we also need to make sure we secure it in the backward direction. Reason being is when we deploy, deploy our parachute, we're gonna use a small explosive charge. So that explosive charge is going to pressurize the inside of the rocket body tube and push the parachute out. Now, if the motor is not secured, one thing that can happen is that pressure can actually pop the motor casing out the back rather than force the parachute out the front. We don't want that. So we need to make sure the motor is also secured in the rearward direction. Uh, on the right, little example of what could happen uh, in the event of a parachute deployment failure, we get what we call a lawn dart. So the rocket is, remember it's stable, it's gonna end up coming down, nose down, uh, picking up a great deal of speed, hit the ground, you know, see this one has hit the ground hard enough to impale itself into the soil. So we wanna avoid that at all costs. We're gonna talk more about well, what we call motor retention, which is making sure the motor doesn't pop out the back. Let's take a look at that. So, um, in the forward direction, we have what's called the thrust ring. Again, let's, we're shifting gears back to making sure the motor doesn't fly out of the rocket in the forward direction. So we're securing the rocket motor into the rocket uh, so that we make sure the thrust is translated to the rocket. Okay, so on the left, we have an example of a low power motor. The thrust ring is, is this little cardboard ring that's glued into the top of the motor mount. So you'll slide the motor into the motor mount and it'll just push up against that cardboard ring. That's fine for a low power setup. Start getting into a little bit, you know, into the mid power, high power. These are the ammonium perchlorate composite motors. We see in this one, the thrust ring is incorporated into the back of the motor casing. Uh, it's a little bit larger diameter at the back of the motor. That's just what that thrust ring pushes up against the motor mount and that's what transmits the thrust from the motor to the rocket. On the far right uh, is an example of a high power motor aluminum reloadable casing. So when we get into the high power stuff, um, you can just buy the propellant grains and reload them into a reusable aluminum casing. And we see on the back of that, that that gold colored part is a larger diameter than the rest of the, the cylinder. So that gold colored part it acts as the thrust ring, it pushes up against the motor mount. So that transmits the thrust of the motor to the rocket. Make sure the motor can't fly through the top of the rocket and be out of control. Okay, in the rearward direction, we have some various examples of motor retainers here. On the far left, it's just a simple 
uh, spring steel clip. So you bend that out of the way a little bit, you would slide your motor in and then let go and that little, that little hook would engage around the back of the motor. So when the ejection charge fires to push the parachute out, it can't spit the motor out the back, all right? Make sure the motor stays with the rocket. Middle one is uh, one of my rockets where I've just taken a little threaded rod and epoxied it along the outside of the rocket. And I've got a nut and a little washer that just overlap the back of the motor a little bit. That'll hold it in just fine. Uh, the one on the right is an example of a commercially available thread on retainer. So there's a cap that can thread off and put your motor in, you thread that cap back on and it secures the, uh, the motor in place. That one in particular is a commercially available one from a company called Estes. Uh, also Aeropack is a, a popular brand for the higher power stuff. They make uh, retainers out of aluminum. All right, so let's talk about the launch pad. Recall that we said um, our fins are a critical part of keeping our rocket stable. They depend on having sufficient airflow over the fins to keep the rocket stable. So when we're starting from a standstill, we have zero airflow over the rocket. So the fins aren't doing anything, right? So we have to keep the rocket moving in a straight vertical upward direction until it attains enough speed. It has to accelerate to a point where the fins are effective. They have enough air flowing over them. The way we achieve that is either with a launch rod or a launch rail. So on the left, we have an example of a low power launch pad. It's just a little cylindrical rod. It's probably two to three millimeters in diameter. It's fine for a, a low power rocket. We've got basically a little straw that's glued to the side of the rocket. And you'll see that photo second from the right here. That launch rod is just slides through the straw. It's called, the straw is called the launch lug. And uh, we ignite the motor, the rocket accelerates upward while it's sliding along that rod. The rod maintains it in a straight path. Uh, by the time it gets to the end of the rod, which in the low power world is about one meter tall, it's going fast enough to fly on its own, okay? On the right, we have an example of a high power launch pad. We use more of a rail, like a long rigid rail that has a groove running along the length of it. And you'll see in that picture in the far right, we have what we call a rail button. It's just a little protrusion from the rocket with a little flange that engages with that rail so it can slide along that rail and accelerate up that rail. So the rail is much more rigid in the high power world than the little rod that we use in uh, the low power world. Uh, reason being uh, too much thrust on too small or too weak of a rod can get what's called rod whip. So it, the, the rocket will accelerate and basically, you know, the, the rod acts like a whip and you can have the rocket going off in different directions rather than vertically or the direction that you pointed it. Okay. So let's talk about ignition. Again, always keeping safety number one. We want to make sure we are far enough away from the rocket that we can safely ignite it. So the way we do this is we use an electrical or an electronic ignition. So we'll have these um, little igniters that can generate heat or generate a little bit of flame when we put some electrical current to them. We can run a cable out to you know, from the launch pad to where we're standing. So we can do that from a safe distance. So on the left, we have an example of a low power igniter. On the right, we have an example of what you might see with a high power or ammonium perchlorate composite motor. Okay, how are we gonna send electrical current to our igniter? Well, on the left, we have, uh, this is a low power to mid power uh, uh, launch controller. In its simplest form, it's just a battery with a switch. So all we really are doing here is making sure that no current gets to the igniter until we are ready. So if someone's there, um, you know, connecting the electrical leads at the launch pad and they've got their face right by the motor, for example, we definitely don't want the, the motor igniting at that point. So this is really just a way to ignite the motor from a distance and make sure that it's rendered de-energized until we're ready. So the one on the, on the left, um, the, the yellow circle in the center, that's actually a launch key. You can pull that out. That renders it safe. You don't even really need anything this complicated. You could even just have, you know, say a, you know, a wire running out 10 meters from the launch pad 
and a battery. And you can just touch the, you know, touch the wires to the terminals on the battery, as long as you're safe enough, you know, you're far away that you're safe and you can render it absolutely certain that that circuit cannot be completed until you're ready. So maybe you completely remove the battery from the wire or you cover the battery terminals with an, un, you know, a non-conductive cover. The point here with the launch controller is just that, again, you're far enough away at the point of launch and you're absolutely certain that you cannot complete that circuit until you're ready to fire, okay? Uh, on the right is an example of what you might see at a high power club. So this is a radio controlled system. So from a launch control station, um, we can send an encoded radio signal to the receiver and the battery is out at the launch pad and we can fire it from a safe distance. This could be on the order of 100 meters or more away, depending on how big of a rocket flying. You're generally gonna see this at clubs where people can pool their resources. This is pretty expensive. Um, it's not, you know, it's generally beyond the means of an individual. Like our club just bought a new system this year. I think it was on the order of 4,000 bucks US. So again, this is gonna be something that you'll see at a club, but this is the safe way to ignite a high power motor from a distance. All right, so we got a rocket built, we got a motor in it, we created thrust, it's up in the air. What goes up must come down. We need to get it down safely. So let's talk about recovery. So remember that a rocket that is in a stable configuration is going to fly straight. And that's true up and down. So if the rocket runs out of momentum, nose is over, it's coming down point first, it's gonna generate a lot of speed just by gravity. We don't want that. So generally, we will have a, a small explosive charge that will separate the rocket into two pieces. That's gonna cause it to destabilize, it'll tumble, so it can't maintain a nose down attitude, gain a bunch of speed. And we're also gonna include a recovery system so we can have a nice soft landing. So generally that's gonna either be a parachute, which is best for larger, heavier rockets, uh, creates a good uh, coefficient of drag. So it creates a lot of drag as the rocket comes down, it's gonna make a nice slow descent disadvantage of the parachute is since you have a nice slow descent, you're subject to wing drift. So if you deploy your parachute up at a very high altitude, you're coming down really slow, but the wind is carrying the rocket horizontally. It could drift a really long way. You might lose sight of it. You might not get it back. So we're going to talk about some, some uh, ways to manage that with the bigger high power rockets as we go along. Uh, for small rockets, you can get away with a little streamer, just basically a long ribbon. Okay, so um, the ejection charge is going to separate that small rocket so it's not in a stable configuration anymore and the streamer creates a little bit of drag, also gives you something that's a visual cue so you can find your rocket more easily. Um, let's take a look at this photo here. We've got a rocket coming down under parachute. Uh, we see that it's been separated into two pieces. There's one section hanging from the parachute up higher. There's also a another section hanging down lower from what we call the shock cord. So when we fire that little explosive charge, the rocket separates. The shock cord allows the rocket pieces to stay connected, but it gives a way for the energy uh, introduced by that ejection charge to dissipate. Uh, and then you'll, you'll fire that upper part away from the lower part. And then ideally that energy from the ejection charge has bled off by the time that shock cord pulls tight. Okay, so we have a nice long shock cord on there. Also in the middle, we see this little black piece of material. That is um, a piece of uh, flame resistant fabric. So we need to protect our parachute or our streamer from the heat of the ejection charger. We could burn it or catch it on fire. So a couple of ways to achieve that. Again, this is an example using a, um, a flame resistant fabric called Nomex. Uh, some folks will also use a wadding, uh, which is basically just like a, a sheet of tissue paper treated with uh, like a bore, you know, Borax uh, flame resistant treatment. I've even seen guys use pieces of lettuce. You know, it doesn't have to be rocket science for a lack of better phrase, but um, we do need to protect our parachute or our streamer from the heat of the ejection charge. So there's a few different ways to do that. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about how we actually deploy the parachute at the time that we want it to. 
So this is a diagram in the center of a small black powder motor. So we said earlier in the presentation that the ammonium composite, uh, ammonium perchlorate composite motors, motors burn from the center out. Okay, it's opposite with the black powder motors. They're ignited in the back of the motor at the nozzle and the flame front travels forward up the propellant grain. So it burns from back to front. So when we burn our propellant grain out, so if we've, while the propellant grain is burning, the rocket is under thrust and there's an unbalanced force and it's accelerating. So at the point that the propellant burns out, the rocket is going as fast as it's gonna go. That's the worst possible time to blow our parachute out because it's traveling through, you know, hundreds of kilometers per hour of wind, right? So we're gonna pop this parachute out into this fierce wind. It's gonna rip the parachute apart. We're also gonna give up a lot of altitude that we would have got in the coast phase as the rocket coasts upward until it eventually runs out of momentum. So we wanna create some kind of delay between the time that the propellant burns out and we burn our, uh, blow out our parachute. So we do that with what we call the delay grain or what here is called the delay composition. The delay is a little bit of propellant that is what we'll say poisoned. It's mixed with an inert material. So it doesn't burn violently. It doesn't create thrust, but it burns at a kind of smolders at a predictable rate. So we can pre-calculate using a software like Open Rocket or RockSim, how long we want that delay to be. We'll select the delay before we put the motor in the rocket. So the propellant will burn, it'll run out, it'll come in contact with the delay grain, ignite the delay grain. The delay grain then burns at a predict predictable rate for a certain number of predetermined seconds, and it will reach the ejection charge, which is a small explosive charge that will blow the parachute out. Okay, so again, if we look at the photo on the far right, where it says E63, remember the E told us our uh, impulse class. The six told us the motor produces six average newtons of thrust during its burn time. The dash three tells us that that motor's ejection charge is three seconds. So that's another important parameter of selecting the correct motor for your flight, okay? Um, let's talk a little bit more about advanced recovery. This is how we're gonna get down large rockets going to very high altitude. Recall that we said if you deploy a parachute at a very high altitude, your rocket's going to drift a really long way. It's pretty easy to make a rocket go high enough that you can't see it. And then the, the parachute deploys at a high altitude, you have no idea where it went, you don't get it back. So electronic recovery is one way to manage that. It also allows us to be very precise in where we deploy our parachutes. So the, the uh, ejection charge driven by the delay grain, they're subject to error, right? Subject to errors in our calculations. Uh, there's also some variability in how long those delay charges burn. So a manufacturer could get plus or minus 20%. Um, if we don't deploy our parachute at the, at the optimum time, we run the risk of damaging the rocket because the parachute's gonna come out, it's gonna be exposed to a lot of uh, fast flowing wind around it and it's gonna yank the parachute around behind the rocket and we can get what's called a zipper, which is where the shock cord rips down the side of the body tube. We don't want that. We wanna to try to deploy the parachute at the optimum time, which is where the rocket achieves zero vertical velocity. It's got the least wind stress on it at that point. So one way we can do that fairly precisely is with electronic deployment. So we've got a flight computer control. There's a little barometric sensor in the, in the flight computer. So realize that as we increase in altitude, the air pressure decreases and the computer is monitoring the air pressure. So as the rocket is ascending, the computer is detecting, okay, air pressure is decreasing, 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 decreasing. And now all of a sudden the air pressure is increasing. The computer says, aha, I'm falling now. It's time to fire a, parach uh, a parachute charge. Okay, so with the electronic system, we can do multiple parachute deployment events. When we get to the apogee or the highest altitude that the rocket reaches, it can, it can fire a small parachute called a drogue, which allows for a fast but controlled descent rate. So we're not getting as much wind drift. And then the computer continues to monitor the barometric pressure when it reaches a altitude that we pre-programmed. You know, it's usually on the order of 200 to 300 meters above the ground, kind of at the last minute, it'll fire a second charge that 
blows a much larger parachute that allows for a nice safe uh, landing. Okay, so this is how we can um, recover large rockets with a parachute, but not have them drift really, really far. We can send them to high altitudes and still have a decent chance of getting them back. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about multi-staging earlier. And we mentioned that with the uh, composite motors, they're harder to stage because they're harder to ignite. So if you're going to stage the composite motors, you're generally going to need some kind of electronic solution. Uh, we've got a battery in uh, one of these computers. They have things like accelerometers and timers. So they'll know when to send current to the igniter of the, you know, the upper stages at the correct time. So for example, a computer might uh, detect the acceleration by the booster motor, the first motor that fires. When that acceleration runs out, the computer says, okay, time to fire the next one. Or it can also be done on time. There's a lot of different safety features. You can put caveats in there like, okay, so you're gonna fire at the end of this acceleration only if you've achieved a certain altitude and a certain speed. So basically that's an indication to the computer that the flight is healthy and the rocket is traveling upward. We wouldn't want to Say, for example, the rocket goes up on the first stage and it noses over and now it's pointed at the ground and potentially people and then fire the second stage. That's really bad news. So um, we need to choose computers that have those safety features built in if we're using them for staging. All right, some of them can uh, do data logging. So the one on the top, for example, the larger computer shown there, it can record uh, altitude uh, speed at you know, 20 samples per second, for example. Um, some can control electromechanical servos, so you can employ this even if you're using like water rockets and you don't have access to explosive charges or gunpowder to make those charges. Uh, you still have some stuff you can do uh, with these computers. Um, it's, more, it's a more advanced technique, but when you get into the, the bigger, higher power stuff, this is really useful. It's a good, a good thing to know. It's also something that's an aspect of the hobby that I really enjoy. These particular computers are from a company called Egg Timer Rocketry, and they come as kits, and you solder all the little parts together and program them yourself. Uh, it's a rewarding aspect of the hobby, in my opinion. Okay, so we've talked about building a rocket, how we're going to power it, how to design it. Now we need to talk about how we're going to get our hands on this stuff so we can do this activity. Unfortunately, this is where I might be a little less helpful. Obviously, I'm you know half a world away. But uh, I'll give you some pointers, you know, to the extent that I can. Um, I did see again on Facebook, uh, fortuitously, this uh, company called Aerosports Association making uh, black powder motors in India might be an option uh, for the folks in Sri Lanka. Um, I saw what looked like a pretty good, well-developed um, supplier, uh, rocketeers.in slash shop might be worth a look. Um, I did do a little bit of legwork here in the United States. Uh, the, the folks that make motors here in the US, uh, based on the federal shipping regulations here in the US for shipping hazardous materials internationally, they can't ship motors internationally, unfortunately. Um, you might check other sources uh, in Europe, UK, Australia might be fruitful for you. Um, might, you can still find uh, potentially people that will ship rocket kits to you from here in the US. So I've listed some different brands here. Estes is the, is the big one here for low power stuff. Um, we talked about Apogee components, a couple other suppliers listed there. Lock Precision and MadCow are good sources for uh, bigger high power kits. Uh, however, just be aware that if you're buying stuff from in the United States or really any other country, uh, the motors tend to come in a standard diameter that fit a, a motor mount, right? So we talked about the motor mount we need the motor to fit in there pretty snugly, pretty precisely. So there are some standard motor mount sizes that we use here in the United States, for example, are uh, 13, 18, 24, and 29 millimeter diameter motors. That's what you're gonna see in the low to mid power range, okay? So just something to be aware of if you're, if you're shopping for kits, you just wanna make sure that it matches the motors that you can source. And you may have to do some modifications to your kit, for example, that's easier to do before you build the kit. So just some things to keep in mind. I'd find your motors first, figure out what diameter they are and go from there. All right, let's talk a little bit about regulations. Um, I did a little bit of research in preparation for this presentation. I, I found it amusing. I came across the website in India, rocketry website in India. 
And they said, yeah, in the United States, they can do whatever they want. They have no rules. They can just go have a good time. That is absolutely not true. We do have a myriad of regulations that we have to adhere to here. And most of the regulations are safety you know, based. So there, it's, it's not a bad thing, but we do have to be aware of them. Um, obviously, I, uh, I'm, I, I'm not qualified to give legal advice in Sri Lanka, but I do want to give you some uh, ideas of the various regulations we have so you maybe know what to look for. You do want to do your due diligence here because we don't want anybody getting in legal trouble, but um, just some examples of regulations we have here in the U.S. In the low power realm, you know, the, the A impulse through uh, about G, um, it's pretty pretty free, but we do have some age, age restrictions and there are certifications required for some of the G motors and anything H impulse and up, okay. Um, there are some regulations involving transport, uh, transporting hazardous materials that comes into play like when we're ordering from an online vendor. Uh, they have uh, hazardous materials, uh, shipping regulations they have to comply with. Uh, storing and uses, using explosives, that can come into play if, for example, you're using ejection charges with um, you know, computer actuated ejection for your parachutes. Uh, we have to comply with Federal Aviation Administration regulations. Uh, namely for high power, we have to get a flight waiver before we fly anything high power. And we also have to be certified to do that. Uh, there may also be local laws, like for example, the parks department, some parks you know, don't want people flying rockets in their park. So these are all just things to consider, do your due diligence, um, stay out of trouble. All right, so that's, um, you know, enough to really kind of get somebody started on this and thinking about it. We talked about how to design a rocket, what materials to make it out of, what adhesives to use to, to complete it. Talked about selecting motors. We talked about recovery. We talked about launch equipment. So, you know, now's the time to just go try it. So again, start small, start with the low power stuff. Uh, always keep safety number one and good luck. And, uh, Let's open it up to some questions. Uh, guys, uh, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand function or type your questions in the chat. You got some chats here. Let's see what we got. Good job. Okay, good. Thank you. Aryan Narga Kadi, he's a good friend of mine. We've been flying right. He's actually uh, of Indian descent, but he's been here in the United States for a long time and we've been flying rockets together for a while. So, Aryan, it's good to see you on the call, buddy. Mm. What is the, the Open Rocket app? So uh, Open Rocket is a, a Java based app. And basically if you just do an internet search for um, Open Rocket, you can find it and download it for free. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to enter all your design parameters like your design, uh, your, you know, your diameter, the length of your nose cone, it allows you to enter in the shape of your fins. Um, that will calculate the, the mass of all the parts for you and the density of all the parts for you and it will calculate the center of gravity, the center of pressure, your stability margin. It'll calculate all kinds of very useful things. Of, you, know, you, you can enter in the wind uh, velocity and direction and based on the altitude that it calculates, it'll tell you how far away your rocket's gonna drift. So you have a sense of, is your launch field big enough? It's very useful software for model rocketry. Um, Ushan and I had talked a little bit about potentially doing a, an open rocket session, You know, just dedicated to open rocket. So you may see that coming, uh, stay tuned. But basically it's uh, the open rocket is a, a really useful uh, design software. 
Um, let's see, make sure I didn't miss anything here. Can we build two stage separation model rockets using two rocket motors? Absolutely, you absolutely can. Uh, like we talked about in the presentation, that's a lot easier with the black powder propellant. The reason being is the black powder is much easier to ignite than the composite, although it doesn't have as much specific impulse. It's not as powerful of a propellant, uh, but it's a great propellant for beginning, especially for multi-staging. So what happens is uh, recall that with a black powder motor, we ignite it from the back at the nozzle. The propellant burns from the bottom to the top. So when that propellant uh, that solid propellant grain burns up almost to where the propellant is gone. You're just left with this little tiny layer of propellant remaining. Eventually that is going to fail just due to the pressure inside the combustion chamber. That little top layer of propellant will just break apart and those uh, little pieces of propellant are going to conflagrate and, and rise up into the motor above them. And that's enough to ignite um, the second stage or the, the sustainer or the motor above it. Uh, you do wanna make sure you have uh, ventilation. So a couple um, opposing holes. So uh, cold air can vent out of the, uh, you know, between the, the booster motor and the upper stage motor. But as long as you have a little bit of ventilation there, that uh, the, the burning propellant from the lower, the booster motor should be enough to ignite the upper motor. Uh, when you get into composite motors, again, you're going to need some kind of computer, you know, electronic solution with a battery where you can apply voltage to the second stage or, you know, the up, you know, upper stages at predetermined times that are controlled by the computers. But yeah, absolutely, you can do multiple stages. Um, can we make solid fuels from potassium nitrate fertilizers and sugar? Will it give good thrust? Absolutely, you can. Uh, that's the rocket candy propellant that we talked about. Um, the, the sugar and potassium nitrate propellant actually has a better specific impulse than the black powder. Not as good as the ammonium perchlorate, but it is a, a respectable propellant. You absolutely can. Uh, again, be careful. Check your regulations. There's places here in the United States where that's not legal. So, um, but definitely a viable uh, propellant. Can we make an engine of a model rocket at home? Is it safe? Like we talked about with experimental propellants, you definitely can. Uh, is it safe? Uh, it's got some risk involved. You need to know what you're doing. Um, like I said, I would recommend starting off with the commercially available motors and then folks will usually progress into the, the experimental propellants. Uh, absolutely, you can do that. It's a really interesting aspect of the hobby with lots of opportunities for research and experimentation, but you have to do it safely. You know, it's, it's something you need to be doing outside, not in the kitchen. Okay. Um, whether or not there are any associations to join students who are like involved with, do we have any organization that like to make robots? Um, I might let some of the other folks uh, address that again. I'm half a world away. I can't unfortunately provide any advice on that, but I'm sure there are a lot of people on the call that can. Are there any parachute deploy units that actively based on real time altitude calculating? Absolutely. Those are the, the flight computers we talked about towards the end of the presentation. They have a barometric pressure sensor. So they have a sense of their altitude and um, they're, they're monitoring for changes in barometric pressure. So again, as the, as the rocket is increasing in altitude, it's exposed to steadily decreasing air pressure. So once the rocket runs out of momentum and starts to fall, and these computers are sampling at on the order of 20 samples per second. So this is a pretty quick response, pretty responsive. Uh, as soon as the rocket starts to fall, it's gonna detect an increase in outside air pressure. It knows, okay, that's when I need to fire the first uh, parachute charge. Um, like I said, egg timer rocketry is a really cool supplier for these things. You can get kits pretty inexpensively for these flight computers and solder them uh, together yourself. Very rewarding, in my opinion. Um, uh, and they put out some really good capable computers, some with accelerometers, some with data logging. Really interesting to check out. Uh, incidentally, if you don't want to solder your own together, there's also options. Uh, Missile Works, Perfect Flight, they sell them ready to go. Um, <clears throat> so there is no nozzle if we use my Absolutely, yes, there is a nozzle. 
um, with the uh, black powder propellants, it's usually compressed clay. So if you have like, if you imagine something like kitty litter and that's just like that clay material that's packed really tightly with a hole drilled in the middle, that's a simple nozzle. If you get into um, the high power stuff, you'll get more of what's, a, what's called a convergent divergent uh, geometry nozzle. It's a little more uh, technical and appropriate for rockets, let's say. But uh, yes, absolutely, there, there is a nozzle. Um, if we look back at, if we were to look back at those photos of the small black powder motors that I showed, um, on one end, it's just got a small hole in the end. That is actually the nozzle. Okay. Nice session. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, show us how to use Open Rocket now. Uh, yeah, I could go into a little bit. I might answer a few of these other questions. Um, like I said, there was some discussion of doing some subsequent sessions as part of this series. We can talk, you know, certainly go through Open Rocket in a lot more detail. We can talk about more advanced things like staging. Uh, clustering, which is igniting multiple motors at the same time, really fun. Um, but uh, we, I, my understanding is we do intend to make this something of a series where we're doing more of these and we can be open to different topics that people are interested in. Uh, but yeah, we can we can dig into Open Rocket a little bit here. Uh, let me just look at some of these other questions. Um, is a sugar rocket made in home as quality as the original motor? It can be if you know what you're doing. Um, uh, one thing you need to make sure you do is you kind of compress that propellant so you're getting any air bubbles and don't leave any room for air pockets. Uh, when you're doing the homemade stuff, you have to be very careful to uh, make sure you don't leave any little air bubbles. That's going to cause like a runaway thermal problem that can cause the motor to explode. So you do have to know what you're doing. But again, like we said, um, the uh, sugar rockets actually have a better specific impulse than the black powder does. So yeah, you can make a respectable propellant out of sugar. Uh, great session, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, working on a model rocket and it has two grain G-class solid motor. I'm struggling to keep the rocket below transonic speeds. Currently an Opa rocket has a Mach 0.7, which is kind of pushing it. What design changes could you make to keep the rocket at subsonic speeds? I mean, you know, anything you do that, that adds weight is gonna, slow it down. I mean, if it's if it's not something that you have started building, anything that you do to add weight or drag is going to slow it down. So um, you could add more fins, for example, that's going to add more drag. Uh, you could make it longer, you know, put another section of tube on it, that's going to make it heavier and add more drag. That's going to slow it down. Um, lots of things you could do to slow a rocket down. One thing you might consider is using what's called tube fins. So instead of like a, a flat wing like fin, you can just take sections of body tubes, like six pieces of body tubes that are just short. That's what we call tube fins, look into tube fins. That's a very draggy design, um, might be an option for you. So look into tube fins possibly. Email address, please. Yeah, I can put that out here. I'm just gonna put that here. What is this record shared for? I mean, I, uh, other folks on the call with SEDS maybe can um, verify this, but I understand this is being recorded. So maybe that's something we can, I'm sure that's something we can share with the group. Um, interesting session. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Um, guys, we have shared the feedback form link for this session in the chat. And Mr. Frissel, thank you for joining with us, sharing your knowledge with us. And- Thank you, it was fun. Yeah, great. And the other thing is we do plan to uh, hold an open rocket instruction session down the line. <laughs> With this workshop, I'm sure Shan has discussed this with uh, you, Mr. Frizzle. Yes, we've discussed it informally. Informally, we haven't uh, set any dates or anything yet, but um, that's something that Ushan proposed, and I would be willing to do. Perfect. Uh, we actually we haven't set a date per se, so 
Correct. Right. It's again uh, something that we informally yeah. discussed, but uh, might be coming on, coming down the line. So, and the other thing is, I noticed a couple of questions asking whether we have any system in Sri Lanka for model rockets and as a to pursue that as a hobby. Unfortunately, we don't have a established system yet. We have a lot of schools and universities and individual groups trying on uh, making model rockets, going through with the ideas and talents, but that is one of the far, far ends of goals we have for this series on rocketry and such. We plan to one day, someday, have a legalized, established system in Sri Lanka for model rocketry and enthusiasts who are trying to go through with their talents. So um, I cannot stress this enough. Please don't blow yourselves up. <laughs> safety first, safety first. Yeah. Safety. Um, I, I would maybe like to pose this question to people on the call. Again, I'm, I'm half a world away. Um, can you give me a sense of, you know, what, what you maybe have researched or understanding or what your, what your feelings are on what the, the regulatory environment might be there in Sri Lanka uh, and also getting supplies, you know, like getting the motors, is it, you know, for example, do you have access to that? Is that something, you know, can people fairly freely move back and forth between Sri Lanka and India and get some of the stuff do you already have it in Sri Lanka? Like, can you give me a sense of where you're at with both the regulatory structure and logistics? I'm no, just interested, I'm just curious. Yeah, in a way, so we, uh, for regulatory stuff, we do not exactly have a regulation yet. So because to most people in Sri Lanka, model rocketry, yeah, it doesn't exist, you know. Okay. And for the-, the regulations don't exist because yeah. the hobby doesn't exist is yeah. basically. Where you're at. The hobby okay. doesn't exist and the ones who pursue the hobby are actually pursuing it as either a club or a university or a school or that kind of thing. So as an individual hobby does not exist and unfortunately that means less and less regulations and less and less connections so we can you know get stuff uh, Sri Lanka. Okay. Um, do you um, do you have a sense of you know say for example if there was a supplier in India could you could you get but get stuff from them do you think? Bit, but, um, and I realize I'm putting you on the spot. I'm not you know I'm just kind of looking for your you know your opinion. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, it's a little bit debatable because uh, taking stuff into Sri Lanka is possible, but we need a large group of people or an organization to actually order stuff, you know, for, mm -hmm. as an example, saying we need five motors or six, seven, that's an issue. But if we say like 150, yeah. You know, then it goes off as an organizational issue. Then we can work something out. But yeah. Individually, See, um, yeah. my friend Aryan, again, he's originally from India, but uh -huh. he recommended this uh, website called Desert Cart. As I was doing a little bit of research for this, I did see that turn up, and he he mentioned DesertCart.in. I also saw DesertCart.in. LK, I believe it was the extension for Sri Lanka, and they had some Estes motors that they showed for sale, but they showed out of stock at the time. So um, that may or may not be an option for you. Yeah, either either from India or Sri Lanka. Mm. Um, sometimes there happens to be some websites that have stocks for the moment. You know, they right. get the stock of like so-and-so amount and when they're sold out they're sold out so right that happens again you know to, to be abundantly clear doing it safely with an abundance of caution but if you're having trouble with these type of supply issues the experimental motors might be a way to go 
or also the rocket, the, the water rockets might be a way to get started. I mean, that's, you can make a respectable rocket with just, you know, the pressurized water. Not a bad way to start if you're having trouble getting your hands on some of these other supplies. Yeah, um, water rockets in Sri Lanka is uh, also not an individual hobby per se. A lot of schools in Sri Lanka actually pursue water rockets as a part of astronomical societies and such as a fun events and all that. In fact, if I remember correctly, Sri Lanka actually holds a genus record for the most number of water rockets launched simultaneously. I think it was two or three years prior. Okay. Uh, I think so, yeah, 2018 or something like that. I will also just real quickly add um, for the, the folks that were asking about doing an open rocket demonstration. Um, I see we're, you know, we're kind of getting long on time at this point and that's not a really quick little thing to demonstrate. However, um, I did provide Ushan with a series of instructional videos and they start from very basic. Uh, the video series is actually geared for 10 year olds for some classes that I taught, but uh, the, the content is still, you know, it's relevant. Like if you're trying to, if you want to learn how to use open rocket and that's, I go into how to create the parts, I, how to determine the center of gravity, the center of pressure, how to run a flight simulation and figure out the altitude and the velocity and everything. So uh, I did provide that video series to Ushan. Uh, that might be something he could possibly distribute. Uh, also on the call uh, that preceded this call uh, a couple of days ago, Ushan ran through uh, some demonstrations of that. That is probably recorded. So perhaps that's something we could distribute. <clears throat> yeah, we actually would, would share that information with the chat. And having said that, depending, yeah, we don't seem to have any new questions. So I let you invite uh, one of my colleagues, Hassan, to wrap up the session and give the word of thanks. Okay. So uh, a very good morning to all Sri Lankans and it's a good evening to Mr. Josh, I guess. So uh, it's been a very it's interesting session. In here, yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's, it's been a very good session and I hope all the participants who are joined with us today gained a lot more knowledge with Josh here. So uh, it's time to thank you all. And uh, first of all, I would thank uh, Dr. Nanda for being here and welcoming you all. And I would also like to thank our chairman, Mr. Oshan, who organized this event. And I would uh, once, once again, and uh, with my whole heart, I would thank our special guest, Mr. George Frizzle, for sharing a lot of insights and uh, to sharing his knowledge with us. So I hope this session had been a very fruitful session to everyone here. Stay, in connected, stay connected with the SEDS SLTC and the SEDS Sri Lanka. We are hoping to give you more contents like this and the more valuable sessions as such. So thank you all for all the participants who have spent their valuable time with us here today. So thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you.